I read a book recently that really changed my outlook on the world around me, and in it, the author writes about an organism, or rather an ecosystem of multiple organisms, that confuse our concept of identity and force us to question where one organism stops and another begins. He also writes about how this organism changed the way we think about evolution and inspired the terms ecology and symbiosis. Some of these microplanets, as the author calls them, have been sent to space multiple times and returned unharmed and able to resume all or most of their biological functions. The organisms I'm talking about are lichens, if you couldn't already tell by these clips and the title of the video. Lichens are estimated to cover up to 8% of the Earth's surface. So the next time you go outside, notice how lichens are found on trees, fences, monuments, gravestones, stone walls, and especially on rocks. They can be found in pretty much any climate, dry or humid, cold or hot, all over the globe. I have a very special guest on today's video. He'd like to say a little something about lichens. Yeah? Oh, you think lichens are amazing. Me too. So what are these crusty looking non-plants? They're still alive, but they're not a plant, so what are they? They're actually a mix of more than one organism. There's the fungal partner, which is called the mycobiont, and that is made up of one or more types of fungus. And then we have the phycobiont or the photobiont, which is made up of the algae or the cyanobacteria. So while the fungus can make all the structures of the lichen body, the algae takes care of the food, brings home the food. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Want to go to the park? This marriage or partnership between these two or more organisms allows these organisms to live in places where otherwise they might not be able to by themselves. In order to survive or thrive in these different environments, lichens need air, a source of clean air, air. as well as a source of water. Water. And this water can come from the air, the moisture in the air. Sometimes it doesn't even need to be liquid water. And it also can come from precipitation or runoff. For example, when it rains, can you see this tree? For example, if it rains tonight or tomorrow, the lichen on this tree will get liquid water on them because of the rain that falls down the sides of this tree on the bark. So essentially, as they're growing, the lichens attach themselves to a substrate. In this case, it was the bark of this tree or this branch. Lichens can be found on many rocks, as well as buildings and stone walls and gravestones. There's actually a species of beetle that has lichens growing on its back, and it uses it as camouflage, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> so how does the fungus actually create this structure? Fungi are made out of these little tiny root-like structures called hyphae. Altogether, hyphae are called the mycelium, and the mycelium is the body of a fungus. So when you see a mushroom outside, the mushroom part is actually the flowering part of the, of the fungus, but the rest of the fungus is the mycelium inside the tree or underground, and that's where most of the body is of the fungus. So in this case, when the fungus is working together with that cyanobacteria or the algae, it makes something called the thallus. So let's pretend that this fruit snack candy thing is hyphae. And this is the little root-like structure of the fungus, okay? But when it works together with the algae or the cyanobacteria or both, as I'm using nerds to represent, Okay, I'm back. So now we have this hypha, the singular name for hyphae, surrounding the cyanobacteria and the algae, or one or the other, or both. And all together, this structure is called the thallus, and that is what makes up the lichen body. All these structures wind around and make all these different shapes and forms of lichens. Oh no, it's falling apart. And say, I take a bite out of it. Okay, so when I took a bite, you're able to see a cross section of inside. That would be the photobiont inside of the mycobiont. When lichens are exposed to water or humid conditions, they actually change color a lot of the time. And what you're seeing here is the algae are kind of waking up and shining through the fungus layer. So I found this little guy the other day on my hike. It was on the ground on the trail, so I didn't have to pick it off of a tree or anything. And I'm going to expose this to I'm sorry. I'm going to expose this to some water and take a time lapse and show you 
what that looks like. So once the lichen attaches itself to the substrate, the photobiont takes the light and the water and uses it to make food. The fungus then consumes this food and it's able to give the photobiont the shelter and the sunscreen and the protection from the elements. Scientists believed for a very long time that lichen were made up of only one fungus and one algae. They had no idea that there were this many possibilities for the variety that we see in lichens now. And it's still being studied. We still don't even know all the possibilities there are for all the different organisms and the combinations that can live together in a lichen. There was a German botanist named Albert Frank that was actually really inspired by lichens and what he learned from them that he coined the term symbiosis based on this relationship between more than one organism. And this was before we even knew that there was more than one fungus and one algae or cyanobacteria. And scientists often argue still about whether the relationship between these partners are mutualistic or parasitic. A lot of scientists actually believe that the fungus is sort of trapping that bacteria or the algae to make food for it and the algae doesn't really want to be there. But other scientists have a bit more of an optimistic view on this relationship and they think that it's more mutualistic. So they think that the fungus gives and the algae gives and they live in this almost like an equilibrium together in this lichen. There's three main types of lichens. The first one is crustose. Crustose lichens are the ones that look almost like they're part of the substrate. So if you saw one on a rock, you wouldn't be able to peel it off like you might be able to with a foliose or a fruticose lichen. It sort of looks like when you spill coffee on your carpet and it soaks it in, becoming one with the carpet. <laughs> The next growth morphology is foliose lichens. These are the ones that resemble leaves or lettuce. These ones are a little bit more 3D on their substrate and if you wanted to, you could probably scrape them off with a knife or something. They're usually attached by at least one connector onto the substrate with the edges poking up a little bit. And lastly, we have fruticose lichens, which have more of a branched appearance. They are usually attached by just one connector onto the substrate and flow off of it like a mane on a horse or a potted ivy with with its vines falling towards the floor or climbing all over the walls. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a lichen on most of the trees called Grandfather's Beard. I used to think this was a moss, but apparently it's a fruticose lichen. And that's what the growth forms of lichens would look like if they were on a sandwich. And over the last couple of days, I walked around outside and did my best to try to find the three types of lichens. Um. <laughs> lichens over here on this little driveway marker thingy. It looks like there's a few different kinds here on this one location. We got this white, the really bright white one, and then we have like the lime green, and then this one that looks a little more 3 compared to the other ones. I think these would be considered crustose lichens. I think this would be folios lichen because you can kind of see the edges of it are kind of sticking up a little bit. I think like these darker brownish looking ones might be crustose lichens because they're not really sticking up as much as the other ones. And then we have all this moss. That's just one little boulder. You can just see a lot going on in that little boulder. Same with that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. <laughs>
found a piece of lichen on the ground. I believe this is a folios lichen, leafy. See how it kind of looks like a piece of lettuce? <laughs> I wouldn't eat it though. There's still some bark attached to it from the tree that it came off. This specific boulder has lots of pestos lichens all over it. And here you can see the quartz pebbles in the quartz conglomerate. And there's even little pieces of lichen on there starting to break that down. Okay, so this is one of those situations where I'm not sure if all of this is moss or if some of it is lichens. I'm pretty sure the greener ones are definitely moss. These kind of look like they could be the fruticose. Oh my god, I almost just fell. Those light green ones look like they could be fruticose lichens, but I'm not sure. What I was trying to say before the wind so rudely interrupted me was that lichens can survive in a variety of conditions, including cliffs subjected to high winds and lots of rain, snow, and ice. The rocks in this area are also pretty much void of any nutrients. They're sandstone made up of almost exclusively quartz. So this kind of proves that lichens can survive on pretty much anything and further showcases the fact that they're self-sufficient and don't need many nutrients from the substrate to survive. Lichens have also been used in the past to estimate retreats of ice sheets since they are the first to grow on bedrock and some can live up to thousands of years. This area was heavily glaciated up until about 13,000 years ago when the ice sheets started to retreat back north. As you can see by this glacial erratic on this cliff dropped by the ice as it melted and moved. Now, as a geologist myself, usually lichens are more of a nuisance because they cover lots of rocks and it makes it harder for us to see the fresh surface of rocks and that is because lichens do a lot of weathering on the rocks that they inhabit. So lichens weather rocks in mainly two ways. First way is physical weathering and the second one is chemical weathering. So the way that they physically weather the rock is they bury their little roots in and the roots are called the thallus, like I mentioned before. They bury these little tentacles into the pores in the rock, into the fractures, and sometimes in between the individual mineral grains. And sometimes they'll even creep in between cleavage planes of the mineral as well. So this is really similar to when you see roots of a tree growing in between rocks and sometimes even like the sidewalk and they're breaking apart that rock or the sidewalk. It's kind of just like that, but on a much smaller scale. This is a pretty intense example of biological weathering right here. This tree I think is gone, the one that was here. Unless it might be part of this one. But anyway, you see how the roots have grown into the very thin soil on top of these rocks and burrowed into the fractures of the rock and the fractures are already the, the weak spots that are already in the rock now that it's breaking the rocks further apart pretty crazy how trees can just take over rocks like that look at that one Another way that they physically weather the rocks is by expanding and contracting when they're exposed to water they expand and then when they don't have water in them they contract this pushes apart the mineral grains and the rock and eventually makes them crack even more and more until pieces of them break off. Lichens also have been shown to weather by frost wedging, which is a really popular weathering phenomenon on larger scales as well. And for the second type of weathering, chemical weathering, lichens can produce up to 600 chemical byproducts, which then affect the rock that they're released on. One major byproduct that has been studied in relation to this is oxalic acid. Many lichens release this acid and it seems to be a major byproduct affecting their rock substrates. Oxalic acid and other byproducts can alter the minerals in the rock through various chemical reactions, therefore weakening the rock over time. 
There was actually a situation not too long ago at Easter Island where a team of people got together to clean the lichens off of the monuments because they were beginning to break down the minerals in the stones, forming a clay-like film on the surface. The porous volcanic rock that these statues are made out of is more susceptible to weathering and many of the minerals in these rocks, like feldspars, turn to clay minerals when chemically altered. Lichens that live on rocks even have their own special name and that is Saxicolis lichens. And these are lichens that tend to like making their homes on rocks. Some of them like to dig their hyphae deeper into the rock surface. And by deeper, I mean up to three or four millimeters. <laughs> so some lichens like to dig deeper down into the rock as far as they can, while some of them stay mostly on the surface and spread more laterally out. Just like some trees like to dig their roots deeper while some like to go um, outward more. So like I said, the algae or the cyanobacteria provides all the food that the fungus needs to survive. So the substrate is not a major food source and it's pretty much the same as me sitting on this rock. I'm sitting on it, but I'm not eating it. <laughs> so when lichens weather rocks, they are affecting the rock, but they're not using it to its advantage. Sometimes they take some of the nutrients from the rock, but it's not like they need it to survive. So it's kind of like they're taking a bite out of the rock and spitting it out, but they're not eating it. <laughs> so if you walk outside right now and you see a bunch of lichens and you see lots of different kinds of them, that means you have pretty clean air. So congratulations. I'm not talking to you, LA. I'm sorry, there are pretty much no lichens in LA because of the air pollution. <laughs> Another insanely cool thing about lichens, and there are a lot, by the way, is that they're a major source of soil formation, and this is called pedogenesis. When an area is primarily covered in bedrock, the pioneers, as scientists like to call them, the lichens, first colonize the bedrock, and they form the first soils, mainly by weathering the rock like I was talking about, but also by contributing to the soil material when they die and fall off of the substrate. And soils are extremely important to our way of life and our sources of food and many other things. So lichens are very important, and they really affect us. So next time you go outside and you see one of these little guys, unless you live in LA, sorry, give them a little thank you. Give them a little applause and tell them that you appreciate them. <laughs> so as you can tell by now, I've taken a lichen to learning about lichens. I couldn't go this whole video without doing some kind of lichen fun, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, that's all I have to say about lichens for now and I hope you learned something and thanks for watching.